Hello and good afternoon and welcome to this uh, webinar. Um, I'm Paul Johnson, Director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, and I'm really delighted to um, welcome you to this the first major output of the uh, Deaton Review of Inequalities, or put it another way, actually the first major uh, airing of the big one of our big inputs, because what you're going to see today uh, is work that's been carried out um, by a, a number of people looking at uh, what is the problem with inequality, and we'll come to what that means in a minute, and people's attitudes to inequalities. And we on the uh, panel, who will be writing the final uh, report for the review, will be taking all of this information into account as we think about what our final uh, conclusions ought to be. Um, I'm really delighted uh, with the extraordinary lineup of speakers um, we've got this afternoon. Uh, the, the, the main speakers uh, will be initially Professor Deborah Sachs, who is actually a member of the Deaton Review panel and is a professor of philosophy uh, at Stanford uh, University. And she is co-authored with Stuart White, uh, a piece for us which is essentially looking at, from an ethical point of view, what it is about inequality we should be worried about. Then Professor Bobby Duffy of King's College uh, London, who has written a, a major input for us on people's attitudes to inequality, um, including uh, a substantial new survey of people's attitudes. And then Professor Stephanie Stancheva of Harvard University, who uh, is an economist working in particular on people's attitudes to um, inequality, and who will put uh, some context around some of the results that Bobby's going to be Presenting. Finally, Angus Deaton, uh, of course, chairman of the uh, review, will um, will provide a, uh, some response uh, to some of those um, those inputs. Uh, everyone who is watching ought to um, have a link to the Slido um, app, and if you want to put any questions in that, uh, we should have half an hour uh, after the speakers have spoken, uh, where um, I can put some of those questions to them. And don't forget, you can vote for uh, questions that you like, and those will float to the top of my screen and are therefore more likely to be um, uh, used. Um, but before we move to um, Deborah, who will be the first uh, main speaker, I'm going to hand over briefly to Tim Garden, to whom we are all uh, extremely grateful and hugely indebted, uh, because Tim is the director of the Nuffield Foundation, who have very kindly funded uh, this uh, huge um, initiative, uh, and the initiative being the Deaton Review um, as a whole. Uh, so Tim, if you'd like to um, kick us off and then we will move through the speakers without um, returning to me until the end. Well, thank you very much indeed. And thanks for giving me this moment. Really just to say on behalf of the Nuffield Foundation, how hugely rewarding it is to see the outlines of the Deaton Review now beginning to take shape. Because quite simply, this is one of the most important projects that Nuffield has ever funded. I say that with my apologies to any of our other distinguished grant holders who are probably in the audience. I say it's because, partly this, because this review of inequality in the 21st century exemplifies Nuffield's original purpose, the advantage of social well-being, one that dates from nearly 80 years ago with its roots in the post-war social settlement that in many ways still remains this country's key point of reference. But more importantly, I think the Deaton Review has the depth and the breadth, both to define and refine the medley of arguments that are swirling around our current debates and politics in the UK and elsewhere. And it provides the intellectual framework necessary if there's to be any attempt to construct a renewed social settlement with a coherent policy agenda, providing, of course, our politics is in any condition to listen. A brief piece of context, the Nuffield Foundation research agenda focuses on three domains of welfare, education, and justice, which we identify as underpinning a well-functioning society. It is in exploring the relationships between the three that we see our distinctive contribution. And cutting through all of them, of course, is a concern with the social determinants of health or mental and physical well-being. Now, the IFS has for a long time been an exemplar grant holder in understanding the coordinates of welfare policy. And the IFS is also a formidable research partner in our long-standing commitment to education, 
from the earliest years of life to the intersection between the world of study and the world of work, concentrating on the barriers of disadvantage that can shape the trajectory of young people's future lives, and then the interventions that can provide opportunities that would otherwise be out of their reach. And we see our work on justice as being at the fulcrum of our three domains. Improving social well-being requires an underpinning framework of law and regulation to ensure fairness, protect rights and entitlements, and to define and uphold norms and values. So overall, Nuffield is interested in how the well-being of a diverse society is grounded in the way it responds to the pressure points of social and economic change as they affect the most vulnerable and disadvantaged. We therefore see disadvantage in normative as well as relative terms. Must, we must include questions of gender, of diversity, and the quality of access to public institutions, as well as just socioeconomic inequalities. All that together makes up for a just and inclusive society. And as we've seen in the pandemic, the nature of inequality is multidimensional. In the past 18 months, people experiencing the most extreme economic inequalities have also been shown to be those at greater risk not just of economic harm, but of facing barriers to accessing justice and education. So I think you can immediately see why the Deaton Review is just the embodiment of our overall purpose. And indeed, over two years ago now, when the IFS first launched that review, Sir Angus conceptualized overarching intellectual framework as to understand inequality in terms not just of income, but of health, wealth, political participation, and opportunity, and not just between rich and poor, but by gender, ethnicity, geography, age, and education. And he said the final report will be built on the rock of empirical findings, but its architecture will be shaped through the values it explored and how these are viewed across society. What concerns people about inequality? What aspects of it are perceived to be fair and unfair? And we're delighted that Bobby Duffy today has joined us and he will explore just those perceptions in a moment. So when we saw this, we judged the proposal to be vast, but a realizable ambition, given all the firepower from the range of leaders in their different academic disciplines that Sir Richard Blundell and the IFS have assembled. I'd also like to thank Richard today, and indeed Rob Jones from the IFS, who's held the whole process together. What really excited me though, when some three years ago now, I first read the review's first iteration, was that it would start by asking that foundational question what is wrong with inequality? And Deborah Satz's paper today now addresses that head on. I'm not going to preempt it in any way, but I did think on reading it, we had here a primer of essential reading for any of our future grant applicants. Deborah Satz follows Sir Angus's original precept in arguing the need for those concerned about economic inequality to keep a broad focus that includes wider human capabilities, social institutions, motivations, and democratic institutions. And crucially, I think she underscores the need to recognize and address inequalities, complexities, and intersectionalities with an explicit warning to policymakers that this debate can't be reduced to solely a matter of income inequality, but must also encompass, I quote, its effects on specific institutions or particular aspects of life, such as health, social relations, and political influence, those aspects of inequality that matter. And I only quote that because she concludes with such a telling phrase, which I think we should all remember, that makes clear that policy shortcuts have consequences for the experience of those individual lives that are led underneath the data. And she says, it's but worth bearing in mind that one person's simplification for the sake of tractability is another person's life. Indeed, it seems to me from Nuffield's point of view, that the moral urgency, which from the start has characterized Sir Angus's account of his review, demands both of social scientists and policymakers alike however macro or intricate their analysis, that they should place in the center of their concerns a sympathy and understanding of the value of another person's life. So we're hugely looking forward to today, to reading and hearing Professor Sack's paper, and to Sir Angus and the other respondents to it, and of course, in the months ahead, to what follows from it. So now, let me pass directly to Deborah Sats. Deborah. Thanks. Um, it's uh, uh, great uh, to be here, um, and I look forward to our discussion. So I'm going to uh, um, talk about what's wrong with inequality. Um, and if you could go to the next slide, Greg, 
Um, and I, I'm going to do it by, um, I want to lay out a little bit of the landscape that there are many concerns people have in the neighborhood of equality uh, and, in, and uh, inequality, but that are distinct from it. Um, but they're very compelling on their own and they uh, raise a question, why should we care about inequality as opposed to caring, for example, about how people fare? There's something odd about caring about the difference between people as opposed to caring about how the people are doing themselves. So I wanna ask why and when do we care about the difference between people? or between groups of people. And it's clear that not all kinds of inequality matter. There are lots of inequalities between us. We may be of different heights. We like different movies. Um, we worship different gods, which are not um, objectionable in any way. So what makes an inequality objectionable? And I'm gonna run through very, very quickly. Um, some uh, aspects of the causes of an inequality and the consequences of an inequality that raise it to a level of concern. And if you can go to the next slide. So first I wanna just start with a view that's sometimes uh, known as sufficiency. You might think of it as a concern with poverty. Harry Frankfurt, a, a philosopher at Princeton puts this very well when he says, look, from the moral point of view, what matters, what's important is not that everyone have the same, but that everyone have enough. If everyone had enough, it would be of no moral consequence whether some had more than others. And a lot of people who are concerned about inequality, when you try to parse what's going on, are really concerned that there are just some people who do not have enough. They're concerned about poverty, and the Frankfurt or the sufficiency view is that should exhaust our moral concern. And since I'm, I don't think that's right, I want to motivate why, although a concern with sufficiency is important, it's important that people have enough. First, what is enough can be relative to what other people have. But even besides that, we have sometimes reasons to be concerned with inequality. If you can go to the next slide. There's another view in the neighborhood of um, a concern with equality, and that's the view that what matters is um, that when people are worse off, we have more of an argument to benefit them than people who are better off. And you can think of this as something like there's a marginal decreasing utility, the dollar is worth more to the poor person than it's worth to the rich person, if you have a lot. And so prioritarianism sounds like an egalitarian view, but it isn't quite an egalitarian view because an egalitarian might object to inequalities even when removing the inequality doesn't benefit people who are worse off. And that's sometimes um, put as a criticism of egalitarianism that it will favor leveling down, um, bringing uh, the top down if it's impossible to bring the bottom up so that people are equal. Prioritarianism avoids that, um, uh, that problem. If you can go to the next slide. So what is it about equality as an abstract idea? <laughs> As I said, it's comparative. It's concerned with how an individual or a group or a nation uh, compares with respect to others. It's not self-referential. It's always comparative. And it's indifferent to level. You know, to be concerned about equality simpliciter, you don't care whether it's equality at a very high level or equality at a very low level. And as I said, that sometimes leads um, to an objection that in theory, um, egalitarianism might level down. In practice, many of the things that look like they're leveling down actually do benefit the um, poorest, but we can talk about that in discussion. So let me, um, if you can go to the next slide, Greg, um, just mention to why, what is it about inequality? Why should we care about it? And I'm gonna give 
a couple of reasons, some of which are backward looking and some of which are forward looking. And so the backward looking arguments uh, or reasons to care is sometimes we care about how an inequality came about. So for example, in the United States, we have very significant uh, wealth uh, differences between black and white um, uh, American citizens. That's the result of past injustices which prevented um, black uh, Americans from owning homes uh, and or owning homes in, uh, in, in um, uh, better neighborhoods. So you might say there's an injustice here because of the origins of the inequality. If people steal um, and you're richer than I am because you stole, that's objectionable. We also might object to the inequality because we think it comes about through um, an imperfection uh, in the way the market ought to work. Uh, monopolies and monopsonies are able through their size and control um, to um, stifle benefits that, um, possible benefits to others. Um, they can command um, exorbitant prices. Uh, they have an objectionable degree of control over people. And so we might say, look, the reason I'm in this position is because of these um, monopolies and monopsonies. And then sometimes we care about an inequality because we think it's taking the result of taking unfair advantage of some people's vulnerability. When people have very few options and they accept let's say a, a wage or a, um, a benefit that's much less than we think would be fair um, because of the circumstances and the unequal bargaining power of the two parties, we have reasons um, to object. If you go to the next slide, but often um, the reasons people object to certain kinds of inequalities is because of their consequences. And I wanna just quickly go through um, three uh, of quite a number of consequences for being concerned about um, certain kinds of inequality. And um, I say, it, you know, again, there's a, uh, it's not a simple view because there isn't one reason to object to inequality. There are multiple reasons why an inequality might rise to a level of, um, of concern. A kind of overarching view um, is the uh, uh, consequence of inequality is what um, sometimes has been called status inequality. So the ideal of being a full member of society is that everybody is a full member of society and has access to the um, wealth and um, uh, the civil is what civilization has to offer. And some forms of inequality prevent that. They leave people in a second-class citizen. Uh, they're not fully included. They don't have access to the, um, to the goods of the society on terms equal with others. That can be because of discrimination. It can be because of the background uh, social structure that uh, keeps some people out of access to these social goods. Um, and uh, it, it can be because elites uh, uh, capture the goods at the top and refuse to share them. And a lot of concerns about inequality are really concerns about status. And that goes from everything to how you're treated by the police to what access you have to good schools um, and so forth. Uh, you might think that subsumes the next two um, uh, uh, consequences because they do bear on status, but I wanna uh, single them out in their, um, in their uh, own right. Uh, we sometimes care about inequalities because they lead, um, or they undermine equality of opportunity. The equality of opportunity is a very important ideal. We argue in our societies about what it means, uh, but I think many people think it's not enough to have, for equality of opportunity simply to have the formal barriers removed. The people really need a substantive uh, fair chance 
um, to succeed in life. And some forms of extreme inequality, particularly inequalities, uh, and you can think about health inequalities, education inequalities, housing inequalities, um, can undermine uh, equality of opportunity in the sense that everybody's got a fair shake. And finally, um, a, a reason to be concerned about inequality, and this is a particular problem in the United States, is you might worry that the kind of inequality there is leads to political capture or the inability of ordinary citizens to participate as full members. Um, uh, and by, full, by participate as full members, I mean have depend, an, equal uh, an equal opportunity to run for political office uh, and to influence the political process. And there's a lot of research now that shows that um, rich uh, Americans disproportionately influence the political process and um, that the barriers to actually running for office um, are quite substantial. So um, this is, um, a, uh, it's wonderful for a philosopher to be involved in this uh, very exciting project. This is, um, I should say, this chapter is written with Stuart White of Oxford and um, look forward uh, uh, to our discussion. And I will hand it over to Bobby Duffy, who's the next speaker. Thank you so much, Deborah. That was just fascinating and uh, really helpful and important. I'm going to share my screen now. Hopefully, you can all uh, see that. So we, we, our chapter is focused on attitudes to inequalities, and it was very much focused on inequalities rather than just economic inequality. And what we did was review the academic literature and review the extant data. And what we found from that really was there was, wasn't an awful lot on inequalities, attitudes to inequalities outside of economic inequality. So we did, as Paul says, do our own uh, large survey. And that's what I'm going to be mostly focusing on today, although some uh, extant data. And this, again, was a very much a team effort uh, with Rebecca Benson, Rachel Esketh and Kirsty Hewlett from uh, Policy Institute. Um, so I'm going to try and make five points in my uh, 10 minutes. And the first is that there is a large and stable majority that think income gaps between rich and poor are too high. And you can see that all the way back to 1983 on the British Social Attitudes Survey uh, measure. So uh, we got about eight and 10 people agreeing that the gap between those with high incomes and those with low incomes is too large. And it bubbles around a little bit, but doesn't change very much despite very different inequality, income inequality settings during that kind of period. So it's a pretty stable picture. But then when you ask people whether they, uh, whether they agree that we should redistribute incomes from better off to those that are less well off, we get a much, much lower, still pretty stable around four in 10 of the population, but much lower, half the level of people saying that we should be redistributing, even though we think the gaps are too high, which is an interesting um, contrast. And there is a different survey, European Social Survey, which asks the question differently about whether the government should take measures to reduce differences in income levels and not mentioning direct redistribution. And you do get higher agreement with that, more like six in 10 people agreeing that that's the case. So we, we do have this sort of aversion to redistribution or some of the population uh, do. And we look at that in the chapter and it's, it's more particular groups um, of conservatives and others that don't like that type of direct action. But still, even with that softer measure of the government should take measures to reduce difference in income levels, there is still this gap between people identifying the problem and saying that we should take uh, some action. And we think some of the reason for that is some of that gap is related to how you see inequalities, and in particular, whether they're down to structural factors or down to individual factors. And so we took our, our large survey, which asked about lots of different dimensions of inequalities, and performed statistical analysis called latent class analysis on it to uh, see what groups came out across those different types of factors. And in, in the end, we got three roughly evenly sized groups, um, structuralists, individualists, and in the middle. And the structuralists who are about a third of the population, 
they do see characteristics outside the individual's control as important to determining inequalities. Um, so that's across all sorts of different factors about discrimination. And whether you think you're coming from a wealthy family, those types of measures are important. And interestingly, this cuts across demographics. There are variations, but it's not uh, all concentrated in one particular type of group. But they are more likely to be labour supporters, as you expect, and interestingly, more likely to be graduates to be higher level education, have a higher level of um, education. Um, the individualists, again, around three in 10 of the population, are, are basically the other side of that coin. They do not consider factors beyond individual's control to be particularly important. They tend to reject that. And again, their profile kind of cuts across demographic groups, not possible to really accurately predict just on demographics alone, but they are more conservative. They are a bit older, more conservative and fewer uh, graduates. And then we do have this in the middle group um, who are uh, again, just over a third of the population. And they are in the middle in two senses. Um, they're in the middle because they kind of come in, between, in their attitudes. They come somewhere between structuralists and individualists, depending on the issue. But also they generally don't have particularly strong opinions. Nothing is very uh, fair or unfair in those uh, in this group. And they are closest to the individualists in terms of their profile. They're closer in terms of their education levels and their political uh, kind of support. And you can see the importance of this worldview just with one example, which I'll give you which was on a question that we asked people around uh, where we told people that on average, black people in Britain have lower earnings and are more likely to be unemployed than white people. And whether they think those differences are because of different sorts of factors, building on a question that's asked a lot in the US. And the, the first factor was about discrimination. Is this because of discrimination? And you can see people more likely to think it's about discrimination than not, 47%, but 30% think it's not to do with that. Uh, and one of the other factors that we asked about was whether black people don't have the motivation or willpower to pull themselves up and out of poverty. And that's strongly, that's rejected by a strong majority of people, 66%, but there are still 13% of the population, one in seven of the population who think that is the case, which seems quite high perhaps to start with. But if you compare that with the US figures uh, from 2018, you can see much lower belief in this is about willpower and motivation among black people, uh, similar on discrimination, but much lower on motivation or willpower compared to the US. And that US trend has been going down. It was higher in, in the past. So we, we are not, uh, no, we're not as focused on that as an explanatory factor as you see in the US. But the critical point for our uh, segmentation into these three groups is, is that picture very much depends on your underlying worldview as revealed by the segmentation. So when you break it down by those three groups, unfortunately, you think it's down to uh, discrimination. You can see uh, two thirds of the structuralist group think it's down to uh, uh, dis uh, discrimination, uh, half that level um, among uh, individualists. So it very much depends on your starting point is the key point here. Uh, and so when we look actually, when we look at that uh, structuralist, even the structuralist view, 20% um, of that structuralist group don't think it's down to uh, discrimination. There's different outcomes for black people. So it is not an all encompassing uh, worldview. And I think part of that is related to this third point, which is there, there is a general belief in the importance of individual effort and meritocracy in Britain. Uh, you can see that when you look at international surveys, we quite come quite high. On that, and you can see it in our own survey that we did when we asked people about how important a whole range of factors were in getting ahead in life. And this is the proportion who say each of these things is essential or very important, broken down by different political party supporters in this case. And you can see at the top there, hard work and having ambition come out top, uh, at or near the top for both conservative and uh, labor supporters. We do have this strong sense in that this is this is a down to individual effort, individual uh, ambition in many ways. Having a good education comes next and is again supported across different groups, but it's this bit here that uh, is the difference where uh, Labour supporters much more likely to say it's also to do with knowing the right people, coming from a wealthy family, having well-educated parents, having political connections, a person's race or um, gender. So it's not that 
that uh, structuralist group or the labor supporting group don't think that ambition and hard work is important. It's just that they overlay these other factors that are more structural onto uh, what people's life chances and whether they actually do end up getting ahead. Uh, and that belief in merit, that strong belief in merit and effort is clear during the pandemic even. So we ask people, uh, how important do you think luck is in determining whether people have lost their jobs during the pandemic? This was conducted during uh, the lockdowns. Um, and in terms of luck, people not actually, the majority of people not actually willing to give much uh, credence to luck. Over half of people say it's not very or not at all important, much smaller proportion saying it's uh, fairly or very important, as opposed to uh, performance at work. More people saying performance at work is being important in, in determining whether people lost their jobs during the pandemic than that sense of luck, which seems like quite a harsh view in some ways of job losses during an indiscriminate uh, global pandemic. And again, even that is even the case among that structuralist group who have that more structural view of people, uh, factors working against people in terms of determining the outcomes they find. So we do have that underlying sense of effort, hard work, uh, meritocracy at play. Um, but final point, fifth and final point um, from the study uh, is that the pandemic does seem to have opened up space, some space at least, for discussing the government's role in tackling inequality. And you can see that very directly in this question, which just asks whether people agree or disagree that the coronavirus crisis is, uh, means there's more need for the government to take measures to reduce differences in income levels. This is a, that softer wording, not redistribute, but to reduce differences in income levels. And you can see over half of people saying that the experience of the pandemic uh, has increased their sense that the government needs um, to do uh, more or has uh, should have a role in doing more, over half of people picking that out. Again, that does cut across political groups uh, with four in 10 conservatives uh, saying that that's um, the case. Still, the individualists not so convinced. The individualists, when we look at other views on the pandemic, they don't actually expect inequality to increase uh, as a result of the pandemic very much. So only two in 10 individualists uh, think that that uh, warrants additional effort from the government. But in some ways, that's still a slightly open door with even that individualist group, two in 10 of them saying that this has actually changed things a little bit. So across the population as a whole, a bit more of an open door. And then the final point on that, is in when you look across all the different themes and all the different types of inequalities that we look at, uh, the different perspectives and worldviews are very striking. But there is at least one unifying theme um, that cuts across these groups and political groups is the UK's high concern about area-based inequality. Um, so we asked which three or four of the following types of inequalities do you think are most serious for Britain? Um, and what comes out on top uh, overall and is very consistent across uh, groups, including conservative and labor supporters, is that inequalities between more and less uh, deprived areas uh, are important to people um, than uh, income and wealth, which is more divided between labor and conservative supporters and racial between racial and ethnic groups which is even more divided between uh, labor and conservative supporters. So we do have that sense of uh, area-based inequalities being something that uh, brings us together for something that we're concerned about. And we did this study internationally as well across 30 countries. And when you look across all the European countries and uh, the uh, more developed countries in general, including North America, it is the UK that stands out as being most concerned about area-based um, inequalities. Um, and uh, the Deaton Review has done further work with it, Dos Mori, focus groups and further studies on this. And it's really important that it, that is a whole range of things that people have in mind there. This is not a simple north-south divide. People have all, in, in all regions, have experience of uh, noticing areas, being worried about areas that are falling behind relative to other areas within their own town, city, and uh, region. So a very, very important uh, element of uh, understanding that leveling up agenda and what we should do. So just some very quick reflections from me on that, uh, which is firstly that whether you worry about inequalities depends on how fair or unfair um, you see them. That's a crucial factor that runs through the chapter 
that we uh, produced, which in turn depends on your views of their causes in many ways. And that's where that crucial distinction between do you see these things as individualistly driven or uh, through structural means is, is really important to understand. And those types of feelings are, are related to deeply held values and worldview, which I think helps explain why some of the factors, many of the factors that we look at uh, over time are relatively unshifting in terms of people's attitudes. But important to say, to qualify that, that we look at a lot within the chapter and there is more movement in some attitudes and the belief that benefits are too low and cause hardship for people has been rising after dropping for many years in the last few years has been rising in this long wave of increasing concern and you can see how changes in benefits that are coming up uh, will also start to we, we'll keep that momentum going likely to keep that momentum going in terms of uh, public opinion and there is some common ground uh, particularly around area-based inequalities, but we need to interpret that carefully um, if we want to deliver on the public perception and then expectations of levelling up it is uh, much more than north-south or regional level inequalities. It is much more granular and local. That's how people see these types of things working. Uh, but in the end, I think what the research as a, as a whole shows is that we do have an open door for discussion with the public here, but crucially, only if we understand the wide variety of starting points that they, they, they bring to this. And hopefully this chapter is some useful evidence uh, to feed into the review. Thank you. And I am going to hand over to Stephanie. Stephanie. Great, thank you so much, Deborah and Buffy. This is really absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm, what I'm going to show is very complimentary. So thank you so much for the, uh, for the invitation to be in this panel, which is um, incredibly fascinating. Um, my short piece uh, that, I, that I wrote is really on the perceptions that people have and their views on redistribution. And it's going to um, address many of the same topics that Deborah and Bobby spoke about. So in these 10 minutes, I just wanna present a few of the key results, which are mainly centered on uh, surveys that, that we have done. Um, for the broader literature and many other pieces of work, um, you, can, you can look at the article. So the, the starting point um, you know, for, this, uh, for this work is really that we see a rising, rise in inequality, but really no, not much change in the demand for redistribution, um, as Bobby also showed. And our standard theory, the famous median voter theorem, predicts that higher inequality should normally lead to an increase in the demand for redistribution uh, as policymakers try to cater to the, to the median voter's preferences. And this is not generally true in the data. And part of the explanation of this puzzle uh, is that it's not only or even not mainly reality sometimes, but people's perceptions and beliefs that, that shape support for policy. It's about the perceptions of inequality itself but also some other key issues that can deeply influence people's views on redistribution. And they're related to what Deborah and Bobby spoke about, how fair people perceive these inequalities to be, what they think their causes are. And um, you know, the, the method really, a great method to talk about these uh, issues is um, social economic surveys and experiments, which is a way to get into people's minds and see how people form their views on economic issues uh, in the broader social context. So taking into account social phenomena, not just economic phenomena. And this new generation of surveys and experiments really lets us see things that are otherwise invisible, like perceptions, attitudes, knowledge, and views. And such surveys and experiments are a particularly appealing tool to understand how information interacts with misperceptions and how views on redistribution can be shaped. And so let me summarize some, some core findings that we have, um, that we have found over the, over the years on demand for redistribution. So the first important thing is what people actually think about the causes of inequality and in particular, how fair the whole process was. That brings us to the question of social mobility. Do they think that there were equal opportunities to start with or not? So we did this big survey uh, where we try to see what people actually know about mobility in, in five countries, uh, including the UK, and how that shapes their views on policies. The existing theories predict that you know, the more you believe in equality of opportunity, that everyone has the same chances of making it, the more you're willing to tolerate inequality of outcomes. 
And so here's how we elicit, for instance, people's perceptions about mobility. We show them these two ladders with the parents' income ladder to the left and then the children ladder to the right. And we split you know, people between the richest 100 families all the way to the 100 poorest families. And we ask, take kids from the 100 poorest families, out of 100 kids there, how many will make it to each of the groups when they grow up? And so we can see what people actually think. So we can start with one perception, which is the perceived probability of remaining stuck in the bottom, so staying in poverty. So on the horizontal axis here, you can see the actual probability, uh, you know, out of 100 kids from the bottom quintile, how many will remain there when they grow up. And each country here in the sample is one dot. So for instance, European countries and the UK are in general more mobile according to that measure than the US. Then on the vertical axis, you can see the average perception in those countries. And I've labeled the upper area pessimistic because in that area, countries tend to overestimate how likely it is to stay stuck in poverty. So while the US is relatively accurate on that margin, European countries are too pessimistic about this probability of staying stuck in poverty. We can also look at another metric, which is the probability of moving to the top. That's this idea of the American dream. So here again, on the horizontal axis, we have the reality. That's how many kids out of 100 will actually make it from the bottom to the top. And then on the vertical axis, we have the perception. Here again, European countries are a bit, a bit too pessimistic uh, about the probability of making it from rags to riches. And the US is overly optimistic about this idea of the American dream, although that's not, you know, that's not the case in the data. What do we actually find on the link between these perceptions of mobility and support for redistribution? Well, people who are more pessimistic about mobility definitely want more redistribution. Um, the effect is strongest on equality of opportunity type policies like education or health investments, but they're also there for progressive taxation, more social insurance. Another thing that's very interesting is that there's a big cleavage between more left-wing respondents and right-wing respondents. So while everybody perceives inequality of opportunity to be a problem, it is truly only left-wing respondents that want the government to intervene against that, rather than find other means, for instance, freeing up the economy, having more competition, and actually less government intervention. So to some extent, it seems that although inequality of opportunity is perceived to be a problem, on the right, the government is also perceived to be part of the problem rather than the solution. The other very important topic on um, views of redistribution is uh, immigration and what people think about you know, people that are different from them. Immigration was a lot in the debate in recent elections in the US and in European countries. You know, it played a role in Brexit. And there's many theories out there that generosity does not travel that well across ethnic, national, or religious lines. And so we try to see whether people actually have the accurate perceptions about immigrants and how that shapes their views on inequality and what should be done about it. So let me show you a few key patterns that we find. So let's start with the perceived and actual number of immigrants by country. So on this graph, each row is one country. And then the horizontal axis represents the share of immigrants uh, that's actually in the country. That's the blue diamond and the average perception of respondents from that country, that's the red square. So you can see very clearly that in all countries, respondents very starkly overestimate the share of immigrants. So for instance, in the UK, people think that they're around 32% of immigrants when the reality is more like 13%. And so the differences are not just in the, in the perceptions of the number of immigrants, but also very much in the composition of immigrants. So when we think of the ethnic and religious uh, composition of immigrants, for instance, we can see as well here that people in all countries really overestimate the share of Muslim immigrants. Uh, so for instance, in the US, people think that around a quarter of immigrants um, are, are Muslim, when in fact it's 10% of all immigrants. And we also ask people about their perceived unemployment, education, poverty of immigrants, and receipts of transfer that they get from the government. And across the board, people tend to systematically respond that um, immigrants are economically weaker, more unemployed, less educated than natives are. So to show you just two of those results, on this graph here, we can see the share of respondents that think that an average immigrant receives at least twice the amount of transfer of non-immigrants. 
So in no country is this actually the case. Um, and you see that in a country like France, for instance, almost a quarter of respondents think so. In the, in the UK, it's around 12%. And so there are these perceptions that immigrants get much more than natives. And we also asked some questions that are directly targeted uh, at seeing whether people exhibit some, some bias against immigrants. So in this question, we actually tell respondents about two entirely identical men. Um, we describe them as having the same income, the same family composition, uh, the same age, living in the same place. The difference being that John is uh, from the country and Mohammed is an immigrant. And we asked them, do you think that Mohammed pays the same amount of taxes, more or less than John, and gets more, the same or uh, less transfers than John? And this figure shows the Shia respondents who say that Mohammed gets more transfers and pays less taxes than John. And recall that based on the question, there is no reason to say so. Um, the only accurate answer is they get the same based on the information described. And so only Swedish respondents, you know, don't think that Mohammed gets anything different than John, but in all other countries, there's a substantial share that thinks that just by virtue of being an immigrant, you are receiving more. And so what we find is also that just making people think about immigration by asking them questions on immigration before asking them questions on policies actually makes them significantly less likely to support redistribution. And in the end, the biggest predictor of whether people will reduce their support for redistribution are whether they have the perceptions that immigrants free ride on the welfare system and don't put in hard work. And also the perception simply that immigrants are economically weaker and hence just more likely to benefit from redistribution. The perceived cultural distance actually has much weaker effects and just the perceived share of immigrants is not that important. In addition, what we find is that showing people information on the actual share of immigrants and origins really doesn't shift their views on policies. But telling a story about a day in the life of a very hardworking immigrant, which goes against the free rider narrative, does have some effect. But overall, hard facts don't work very well for immigration. Narratives seem to be very strong and influential. And so the final, um, the final important issue that I wanted to tell you about, which Deborah also spoke about, is people's relative ranking and social position. Um, in another project, which is done in Denmark, where we can match survey data to administrative tax data and see a lot of information about people, we actually ask people to rank themselves in many reference groups. Reference groups such as people born the same year, people living in the same city, people working in the same sector or in the same firm, people with the same education level, et cetera. And so we ask people, rank yourself in all these groups. And what we find is that in general, people are relatively accurate, but people who are at the bottom of the ranking, uh, as we see on this graph here, which shows actual position on the horizontal axis and perceived position on the vertical axis, people towards the bottom tend to overestimate how highly they rank, while people towards the top tend to underestimate. So in a sense, people think others are closer to themselves than they are. They tend to compress inequality uh, and compress the incomes they perceive for others towards their own income. And this is true across groups, whether it's cohort, by gender group, in municipality, by education level, by sector, et cetera. And importantly, how does that shape views on inequality? Well, what we see is that if you are ranked higher in a group, you think inequality of incomes within that group is more fair. And you also think that income differences in that group are mainly due to effort rather than different circumstances, what you can call luck. If you're ranked higher, also much more likely to vote for right, right of center parties. And so this is really interesting that uh, within, you know, within each group, the higher ranked you are, the more you think that inequality is fair and it's due to effort to your own merit rather than luck. We can also see what happens when there's shocks to your social position. So people who experience negative shocks like unemployment, disability, hospitalization, tend to think that inequality is less fair. Their views change when they experience these shocks. On the other hand, if you experience a positive shock, like you get promoted at work, you start thinking things are more fair, inequality is more fair. And then to end, we actually end up showing people where they truly rank. So for instance, this person here on that slide guessed they were at position 70, they were in fact at position 57. And so we show uh, a randomly selected group of people where they truly rank and see what happens to their views. And what we see is that good news don't do much. So if you tell someone they're ranked higher than they thought, 
there isn't much effect. But if someone is told that they are actually ranked lower than they thought, they start thinking inequality is much less fair um, and they get, you know, their views definitely change by receiving bad news. So thank you so much. I very much look forward to the discussion. Um, now I'll hand over to Angus. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, I'd like to thank um, also Deborah, um, Bobby, and as well as Stephanie for these um, tremendous um, presentations and for the chapters that um, lie behind them and that are available on the um, project um, website um, for anyone to get more details um, on this work. Um, let me just say a few words about how this fits in. Um, we have um, many, many more of these to come um, on a very wide range, a broad ranging um, set of topics, and which we're very excited about. Some of them are fairly far along and will be appearing soon. Others will take a little longer. And of course, um, as we go, we learn things and we realize that we need to do other things. So these papers, these chapters that are on the website, and um, three of which you heard today, um, are not the final views of the panel. Um, there will be a report um, at, when we're done with this, um, but um, we have far from thrashed it all out. And um, as I like to say, we're still taking evidence, evidence on facts, as well as evidence on arguments and on theories. Um, some people have said, well, you know, what has philosophy got to do with this? Um, I, I've been very keen from the very beginning of this exercise to have philosophers involved. Um, I met Deborah um, quite shortly before we started this project, and um, she's been an ideal help and guide to us along the way. But it's worth noting there's a long British tradition of contacts between philosophers and economists. And while philosophy may seem very abstract and taking an abstract approach to some of these questions, it can have implications for policy um, really very rapidly. And there's a long tradition in Britain, um, I think of um, Jim Murley's, um, all the way back to Hugh Dalton, who was the chancellor of the Exchequer, who wrote a famous paper in the Economic Journal about how to think about um, inequality, um, Tony Atkinson and March's son or others. And those were people whose views had a major effect um, on policy. And so we do have to step back and think about these things um, and think about why we care about inequality, whether we care about inequality, or in my view, um, more what sort of equality do we want? And one of the views of that that I've um, learned a lot about from Deborah's piece and from um, other readings um, at the same time is this idea of equality of status, um, that we should all have equal standing within a democratic state. And that concept, rather than equality of incomes or equality of wealth, turns out to be extremely useful for judging other forms of inequality, like equality of wealth or equality or inequality of income, do these really affect um, people's standings as equal citizens um, in the country? I, I find that a um, really helpful way of thinking about things. I've also found um, the um, qualifications to the idea of equality of opportunity, which appeals to a lot of people. Um, turns out to be very, very slippery and very difficult um, concept, um, which turns out to be very far from politically um, neutral. So that's also something that we're going to think about and we've been um, talking about too. So the other work is um, also um, absolutely fascinating and a little horrifying um, too, um, because what it's telling us is you know, there's a famous quote, which is usually attributed to Daniel Patrick Moynihan, that, sir, you are entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. Well, that turns out no longer to be true. Um, people, whether they're entitled to them or not, choose their own facts, and they seem to choose their facts based 
um, on their political opinion. Um, and, you know, what do we do about that? And if people really believe totally different things about the state of the world and how the world works, how can policymakers help to make policy in this very fragmented world? And it, we used to think perhaps the press and the media had some responsibility for fixing that. But in a world of social media, the media seem to be making this thing worse, um, not making things better because they give everyone the opportunity um, to um, choose what they believe about the world. And I think some of the stuff that Stephanie showed about immigrants and so on is really quite terrifying. Um, and I have no idea whether politicians can show the sort of leadership that can close those gaps or whether instead, like a lot of politicians, they simply exploit them um, by actually making them worse for their own um, personal advantage. Um, one of the things I took from Bobby's work, and I think it's really important and it's coming out in many chapters in the review, is this importance that people in Britain attach to um, regional or geographical differences, where there seems to be a good deal of agreement. Um, and they seem to be important. There's also something that we didn't really hear about today, but which comes out a lot too, which is education and the fact that even for people who don't believe the government's very good at redistribution, um, they tend to think that the government should enable poor kids um, to go to school or to go to do, um, university. So those two themes, the educational inequalities and area inequalities seem ones that we're going to be talking about a lot um, in the review. Um, one thing that comes up in this too is, is this, um, the question is about, are, are we really talking about inequality or should we be talking about fairness? And there was a time when I thought the switch would solve a lot of problems. Um, and one of the things that fairness tends to suggest is a switch towards procedural inequality and thinking that the system is fair rather than the outcomes are fair. And I like that. But as Stephanie and uh, Bobby's work has shown, there's no agreement on what fairness means. So what you can do is you can switch from inequality to fairness, and then people who are divided suddenly coalesce and say, I agree with that. I, I agree with we ought to get rid of unfairness, right? But it turns out that everybody has their own idea of what is fair, and those are different. So you're sort of back to square one. One of my conservative friends um, who really believes in the market um, calls fair um, the worst four letter word beginning with F and thinks economists shouldn't talk about it at all. Um, I don't agree with that, um, but you can see that it may be just as much, it's not really um, a, a help to resolve, resolve these debates. It's more like um, a lightning um, rod. Um, another thing that I would like to just end by is saying that when Deborah gave a very good list of some of the reasons we might concern with inequality because of their consequences. Um, but Bobby and um, Stephanie made it clear that um, people are very suspicious, many people are very suspicious of the government's ability to correct that. And so, or at least correct it through the tax and transfer system. So, but I think what we heard from Deborah with things like monopolies and so on, the way to fix that inequality is probably by enforcing antitrust rules um, so that you make capitalism work better um, and not exploit people in the way that it does, rather than to tax the monopolists and take away their evil profits. Let's stop them making them. So I don't want to focus on that so much as just make the general point that often the consequences of something, the outcomes don't tell you what the policy should be and the policy might actually be very different. So let me again once um, thank everybody. I want, I haven't thanked Tim, but I want to thank Tim Garden too um, for funding this effort, which has taken off so much of our time over the last couple of years. Um, and I hope that it's going to turn out to be a really worthwhile enterprise and to thank IFS for hosting it. So I think I'm going to hand back to Paul now.
and Paul's going to handle the question and answer session. Great, thank you so much, um, Angus, and thank you, uh, Stephanie, uh, Bobby, and uh, Deborah, for ju just the most fantastic um, hour of presentations I think I've seen in a in a very very long time, uh, and not surprisingly, um, quite a lot of um, people have been asking questions. Um, and actually, the one, the most popular one, which is in a sense the one that Angus addressed right at the end of his remarks. Uh, it's um, the, qu the question I stated is, do people mind at all about inequality? Isn't actually unfairness that matters? Uh, but I think, in, as, um, as, as I think Angus alluded to, um, I think there's a serious question about how far that gets us because there's quite a big question about what counts as fair or unfair. But I think it's worth thinking about that a bit further. And I wonder if I come to you, Deborah, you're nodding um, fairly vigorously. I mean, where, where I mean, can, can, can we get anywhere with that? Um, and, and, and if so, where? So, I mean, we can get somewhere with it. Uh, so let me say, I think there's an important point in that question, which is, you know, a lot of our reasons for objecting to an inequality are not um, egalitarian. <laughs> That we're objecting to it for other reasons, you know. So it's not um, an egalitarian objection to inequality. It's a fairness objection to inequality, or it's a um, uh, a concern with poverty that might lead somebody to object to inequality. Even though, you know, as I said, um, some people really care mostly about poverty. Um, I, I do. I'm, I'm probably more optimistic about the prospects for finding some kind of overlapping consensus on fairness. It's probably not going to be a full one. We're going to see, you know, lots of disagreements, but we do find, and, you know, there are a lot of um, experiments in economics on, you know, how people respond um, in a, a you know, if they're given money, how much do they give away <laughs> um, without being prompted? That people have some kind of intuitive inclination to fairness. Um, and saying, you know, that's not fair is actually, it doesn't end the conversation, but it's a good uh, uh, point because people do care about fairness, even if they uh, disagree about it in a way that not everybody sees inequality as a concern, uh, at, at least certain kinds of inequality. So I, I think the fairness, you know, has some potential, but I completely agree with Angus. It doesn't resolve the issue. You want to know, like, well, what makes this unfair? What is it, you know, that leads us to be concerned? And again, one view is, and it's a, it's a particular kind of view that what makes this unfair is it um, excludes some people from full standing um, in society. I will just jump for one second. I saw one of the questions asked, and it's a great question, why uh, focus on the national level? And obviously there are questions about how you extend this kind of view to um, encompass relations between countries and people around the world, and also forward in time to how do you think about um, future generations. But we've been more focused for the purposes of the review on thinking about um, the national context, although there's some papers that look at other aspects. Can, can I just follow up a bit on that question about fairness? Because I think some people think about it, and you mentioned this as a, an important issue, think about it in terms of equality of opportunity rather than in terms of um, equality. But, but I think I took your sort of discussion of this in your paper to suggest that you weren't convinced that that was a terribly helpful distinction, um, given that it's quite hard to know what constitutes fairness of um, quality of opportunity, given that people have, right from birth, very different um, you know, genetics, environments, um, opportunities, and so on. It, it, how, how far can one take that idea of equality of opportunity as a as a way of thinking about what is fair and, and, and the extent to which one can turn that into something to guide policy? Or is it is that a hopeless task? 
Um, I don't think equality of opportunity on its own um, can get us all the way where we want to go. Um, you know, and, and one point about equality of opportunity is it attaches to institutions um, and those institutions have to be evaluated. So, and you could have equal opportunity to be a dictator, um, but that wouldn't uh, justify right, the, um, the social position of being a dictator. So when we're thinking about the kinds of equality we're interested in, equality of opportunity is one piece. And it's actually a more, I think, a more important piece than people recognize because it, depending on your view, you can build a lot into what it means to really have a fair shake, you know, or a fair, um, you know, a fair chance as opposed to um, a either a strictly equal chance, which, as you say, Paul, is very difficult um, to, to um, define. But we also know that simply having no barriers, no formal barriers is inadequate for actual um, fairness, because some people, again, um, uh, children who grow up in poverty uh, don't have the same opportunities as children who grow up in very, very wealthy families, which devote a lot of their um, resources to cultivating their children's talents. So that, that you can build a lot into it, the idea of fair quality of opportunity, but it can't be a standalone um, substitute for the, you know, the bigger concerns that are, are motivating people. If Bobby or Stephanie would like to come in on this issue of fairness at all. Yes, I, I completely agree that it's um, it opens up the question of in in each context what is considered fair. And it is a bit context specific too. Different policies are just not judged by the same by the same fairness criteria. While there are some general principles, there's still a lot of variation. And everybody wants fairness, but it's very much in the eye of the beholder. And I can just give a few examples. So um, if we talk about a policy that's, for instance, the estate tax or the inheritance tax, it raises some really interesting fairness issues where people, once you make them walk through the whole reasoning, realize that there's quite a dilemma and become really conflicted. So if you take the perspective of parents, many people actually agree across the political spectrum that it's not very fair to tax the savings and hard work of parents that want to give something to their children. But if you take the perspective of children and ask people, well, how fair is it that children from different families get different amounts simply because they're born in, in different families? Again, most people agree that this is unfair, but there's a fundamental tension there. Um, and when you put people in front of the trade-off, you know, people come down on different sides. Um, some think in the end, it's better to let parents pass this on, or others think it's better to equalize, you know, what children get. But it is a very thorny ethical issue there on what ultimately is fair. Um, and then it also very much depends on what uh, information people have. So there's, there's a question for us economists to even you know, determine what the process is through which children's outcomes, for instance, are determined and what, what leads to equality of opportunity. And then there's a whole different aspect of actually conveying that information. Um, when people tend to think that incomes are mainly the result of your own effort, um, your own merit, rather than adverse circumstances, it is partially, you know, it is partially an information issue as well, um, that perhaps there is not the accurate information on what actually shapes people's outcomes. So I think both uh, understanding better what actually shapes incomes and conveying that information, and then drilling down in various contexts, uh, what people think is fair is, you know, definitely the way to go. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's absolutely the case that fairness doesn't get around the complex trade-offs that we're going to make and it doesn't get around this fundamental point about the different worldviews that people bring to this. I would also encourage the panel and, and others in this area to think about, to carefully think about fairness as a communication tool and framing that people can connect with in a different sort of way to inequality. Um, if our objective for the fairness framing is more about that, how do you engage people? How do you get these discussions going and get those rather than 
thinking it, framing it around inequality, I think it does have a value, or at least a value that we should be exploring about that. Because, you know, when we do focus groups, when you do uh, all of the kind of more qualitative research, it is something that people connect to in a much more direct, direct way. Um, so I think it, I think it has a value that shouldn't be dismissed, but it will never, it doesn't solve the complex trade-offs and, and embedded positions. Um, Bobby, Stephanie, there are a couple of questions here really about um, the role of media in um, creating views about inequality and similar questions in a way about what, what it is that might need to be done to um, change the, the, the narrative on inequality in ways that might change people's views. I mean, what, what's your sense of, I mean, I mean, you've described, as it were, what people think. What do we know about what creates those, um, those views? Shall I, I go? I can go. Yeah, I mean, I loved Stephanie's work. Um, I did a, a wrote a book on misperceptions and the causes of misperceptions of social and political realities a while back. And it was just the way, and Stephanie's work is brilliant in making that really real. And I think the, the important thing to bear in mind when you look at that is I, I think it very simply in two buckets that these misperceptions, so how we see the world, is a bit about what how we think and what we're told are the two different bucket so there is there is an element of um, the how we think which is all the identity driven uh, confirmation biases that we're subject to and we look at information in a motivated way with direct with directionally motivated reasoning where we have a, a particular world view and so that's why applying people with facts isn't always going to be that effective it misdiagnoses part of the cause which this is more emotional and identity driven than a completely rational process and you need to you need to bear that in mind and that's you know stephanie's work on narratives and all that that sort of work being more powerful really really emphasizes um that so you have you have that element to it that we come to this with a worldview and i, I guess that's what the structuralist individualist grouping helps them emphasize here and you, it's difficult to change that because it's deeply embedded in our values and beliefs but the second part of the equation is what we're told and that does have an effect. But ultimately, it definitely has. This is a system, not a single cause and effect. So if, if the tone is being set or the information is being set and the narratives that we're being given are of a particular type, that will influence us, whether we're completely aware of it or not. And we've had, you know, uh, great work and look at in uh, how the tone of how the media have discussed welfare in the UK has been interlinked with changing attitudes to welfare uh, over time. So it's undoubtedly an important factor of a more systemic equation that's got both of those factors. And the, the mistake is, is trying to say it's one or the other when it's a system. I talk about it as a, a, you know, a system of delusion in some ways, which, which fits both our worldview and what the context is telling us. So the upshot of that to the answer to the, the question is, yes, it is important. It's not determinant. It won't be completely, uh, it's not, uh, it won't change everything because these are deeply held views among um, different, different views among different parts of the population, but undoubtedly important um, and important to get right and better than we have done in the past. Do you want to add to that, Stephanie? Yes, I, I completely agree. And the, the one thing I will add is another type of um, perception or misperception that, that is out there is on what policies actually do. And sometimes a lack of understanding of what the effects of various policies are, which is understandable. They're not, they're not simple policies. Even if you think of progressive income taxation, it's not, it's not necessarily the case that everyone understands what the impacts of it are. And so one one push that could be, I think, very beneficial is to uh, foster understanding of economic policies that actually act against inequality. We don't understand them perfectly ourselves yet, uh, but we're making progress. And there are many things that could be, I think, fruitfully conveyed um, to people. The, um, there's a question here I want to direct at uh, probably uh, 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 two questions, really, which I want to direct to Angus. Um, about what one is about, which you, um, you you did allude to, Angus, the um, need potentially to move away from a focus on redistribution to other things government can do to impact inequality other than redistribute. Uh, and the other question is a sort of direct one, which is, 
what do we know about the relationship between inequality and growth? Does more inequality mean more or less growth, or can't one say anything very sensible at that level of generality? Uh, thanks. I'm, I'm happy to talk about those, uh, perhaps for too long, so stop me. Um, but um, maybe I start with the, the... I like the monopoly example, because um, if you put it in cruder terms, you know, if the rich are stealing from the poor, which a lot of people would argue, right, then we usually think the remedy for theft is to stop people thieving right, and not actually to tax them, right? And that has all sorts of other side benefits because thievery causes great misery quite apart from, you know, the redistributional effect of it. And I think there's a lot, and again, this is subject for argument, and we're going to have to process this as we go forward, that a lot of people would argue that current capitalism is in a form in which there's a lot of what we like to call upward redistribution going on in the sense that um, people at rich people are very good at predating on the poor. And for instance, by lobbying for tax breaks um, would be a really good example. If you look at what's going on in Washington today where you know Democrats have their hearts in the right places, but their wallets are also in the right places. And, you know, the financial industry and, and the, the rich people in America are pretty clearly going to block um, even things that would seem like obvious things to do, like to forgive the IRS money to collect what it's actually due, um, as opposed to imposing new taxes. That's not even going to happen. Um, so there's just a lot of stuff like that where the rich have so much control over the political process um, that the redistribution that's taking place is not government redistribution, it's private redistribution and it's going in the wrong direction. And the right thing to do would be to stop that, not to tax the rich, though taxing the rich might be the best that you can do um, under the circumstances. The, the other issue is one that comes up along, all, along um, quite often, and it may be that Deborah and I have somewhat different views about this, but um, I actually think there is no simple relationship between inequality and growth. I mean, the, these are two very high level outcomes of society. Inequality is not a lever that you can predict. So you can actually ask questions about would a more redistributive tax system stimulate growth or not stimulate growth? That, that is a well-posed question. What is not a well-posed question is will inequality um, in hamper or in the growth. And it depends on how the inequality is happening. So I can give you two quick examples. Um, if you think of the expansion of big tech over the last 20 or 30 years, um, <coughs> that has generated a lot of benefits for a lot of people. Um, you know, as we, during the pandemic, we realized whether we liked it or not, just how much we need Amazon, for example. Um, at the same time, that expansion of big tech has not only generated growth, it generated an enormous amount of inequality. And, you know, in my book, The Great Escape, I argue that that is the way it usually happens, that when you get, you know, technological change, whether it's Schumpeterian innovation, um, my friend Philippe Aguillon has written very clearly and eloquently about this, that tends to induce a lot of innovation, it induces a lot of growth, but it benefits some people only. Now, over time, you might want to spread those benefits more widely, and that's a very important thing to do. But often those episodes of growth come, you know, in a way that generates inequality. On the other hand, if you go back to what I was talking about a minute ago and you think of people stealing stuff, if you have a society in which the emperor gets everything, right, and all the fruits of growth are squashed, you know, um, we, the, the histories of why China didn't grow, a lot of it would do with a predatory state. So if the state is predating on its citizens or a few people at the top are predating on the system, you're not gonna get economic growth. So that's a case where you get a lot of inequality and you're stifling growth at the same time. So I don't think it makes sense um, though a lot of people like it and you can't get away from it and people write papers on it and use 
um, you know, obscure statistical techniques to try and prove things one way or the other. I just don't think it's a very well posed question, and I think we should stop asking it. Rather than stop asking it, I mean, Deborah, do you have a, a different view on that? I, I'm not sure, Angus, that we really disagree on this. I, I think my view is very much um, in line with yours that there's no iron law between um, inequality and growth the way I think at one point it was seen as, you know, just if there was growth, if there was uh, equality, there would be less growth. Because as the example you gave when uh, the, um, you know, the, the natural, the um, human capital is undeveloped in people, that can be a big drag on growth as when people are, um, you know, in poverty and not educated. Uh, and it's very context specific and also depends on what the institutions are. So I, I don't, I think the only thing I would caution against is thinking you can settle any of that, that kind of question a priori. You want to know in what context and, um, you know, and it doesn't work the same way everywhere. So there isn't any inevitable trade off. There's likely to be trade-offs. There always are trade-offs, uh, but it, it's not an iron law. There's a, there's a question here, which we haven't really looked at in, in this conversation, which is about intergenerational um, inequality and uh, how one should think about that. Um, I mean, I, I wonder, Deborah, if you could start on that. I mean, part of the issue, I think, is you know, how do we think about intergenerational inequality, for example, when we're thinking about climate change or when we're thinking about paying for the costs of um, uh, COVID or um, you know, when we, we, we know that there are certain generations that have done better than others. And I'll move on to Bobby as well, because I know he's done a lot of work on attitudes to that. But perhaps you could start with the, the sort of ethical way of thinking about this, Deborah. So there are really, there are two ways of thinking about intergenerational. There's just um, parents and children. You know, uh, co you know, co coterminous uh, intergenerational um, issues, and there it's really important. I think that people see that even if you have equality of opportunity for one generation, equality of opportunity for one generation can become inequality uh, um, uh, of opportunity for the next generation. Right. So you could have something that looks very fair. Right, parents. Some parents rise up. Some parents don't. Hard work, effort, but children are then placed in a very different position um, because of what happened to the parents. Even if that was fair, you might worry about the next generation and making sure they're in a fair place. Um, you know, uh, you know, there is a maybe it's a leap of faith, maybe this is, it, it kind of transcends uh, Bobby's individual versus, uh, you know, more structural. The belief that um, a future matters and that human beings in the future matter, you can't prove that um, logically to people, but it's, um, it's something, I, I mean, I think that is widely, shared that there's some value to having uh, humanity continue <laughs> and, um, and that we have some degree of obligation to um, uh, be good stewards of the world so that humanity can continue. And then there are debates. I mean, there's more or less some consensus. I think that every human being uh, matters in, and, and when they uh, exist is um, not relevant, whether it's 100 years from now or not. But then there's the question um, about, well, they'll be richer. How do we take that into account? And that will also get you, I think, thinking about um, the fact that people are richer um, is only one dimension of concern. Uh, people might be richer, but the natural environment might be totally destroyed. <laughs> um, you know, So there are many dimensions to to think about. I think the principle that, as I say, everybody's life matters, not something you can prove by logic, uh, even among all of us today, uh, but it's for many of us a bedrock principle that everybody matters. 
Um, and then if everybody matters, they ought to matter uh, regardless of where in time they appear. Um, and that gives rise to some kinds of obligations to the future. Yeah, great. Yes, I'm um, just finished, uh, published the latest book is on generational differences and stereotypes and um, realities about those generational differences. And I think undoubtedly intergenerational equality is going to be a massive theme of the coming years. So we've just had such a concentration, such an increase in wealth and a concentration of that wealth at higher levels, which is creating problems right now, but it's also going to tumble down very unevenly within the population. So there's, there's a false choice between socioeconomic variables, current socioeconomic variables, and these intergenerational issues. Um, they're going to be becoming more and more entwined, and we can see more and more ways in which uh, where and who you're born to is becoming more important in your life chances and outcomes. And that, that is an intergenerational issue, and it matters to people. So in, in 2003, um, over half of people thought that the future was going to be better for kids today than it was for their parents. Uh, but now it's down to a quarter in the UK, and it's down to 13% in places like France. So we've lost that sense of generation on generation progress, which we got very, very used to in post-war kind of eras. And a lot in Angus's work about this in, in Deaths of Despair uh, as well. And But it's important to people. So three quarters of people say that generation on generation progress is important to them. That, 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 that you should have that sense of progress. So I think, I think it's not it is about, it is important to think about how a life chance is distributed among young and old today and um, coming through. But the bigger point is about how is that affecting our faith in the future? And I think that kind of goes to the Angus's and Paul's and other people's framing of the review overall. That this is about faith in the system um, and that sense of unfairness and declining prospects for improvement over time is really, really important to people because while generations are cohorts and there's important cohort effects going on, we're incredibly connected up and down the generations through our family. So it matters to me about my parents. Uh, it matters to me about parents and grandparents, but also matters to me about my children and grandchildren and what, what can they look forward to both economically and in, in, in the state of the planet overall. So yeah, I think that's, that's vitally important um, vitally important to understand, probably and only going to get more important as we see these trends, uh, the economic trends, uh, increase those disparities in life chances, generation on generation. I, I'm going to round, round, round off with one last question, which I'm initially going to throw at Angus, um, but others do feel free to come in. Uh, and there's, there's a question which, uh, you know, I, I think is not, not, not a silly question at all to think about, which is... Um, uh, I think it says, uh, on the assumption that all members of the panel are um, part of the top 1% or possibly close to it, what's the effect of top academics and policymakers belonging to a narrow group when discussing something as uh, wide for society as, um, as inequality? Um, Angus, I know you've thought about this sort of thing, but perhaps you could um, provide some response to that. And uh, I'm very happy for Stephanie, Deborah, Bobby to come in afterwards. Yeah, I, I would like the general view on this. I, I, it's not at all clear to me that it's factually correct, for one thing, um, which is, you know, we, we didn't send forms around at the beginning and ask people um, to sort of state their income and disqualify people on conflict of interest if they had too much money. Um, I suppose we could have done that. But there's a serious point here. And, you know, as someone who's spent a lot of my life working on economic development, one of the great curses of economic development is that, uh, and to me, I think it's a crippling curse of the whole development industry, is that it really just does not involve the people um, who are involved in pot, you know, who, who are benefiting or losing from this. And I think that's a really crippling drawback. So I think it is a drawback. Um, if, you know, I don't know what we could have done about it. I mean, we could have randomly selected people from an income distribution table. Um, I'm not sure we would have got as good chapters that way. Maybe we would. But I'm sympathetic and I, I would, uh, you know, uh, be interested in thinking about remedies. I, I just should add, while I'm sort of on the same point, we will be talking about generational issues later in the report. 
and especially climate issues, which we really do have to talk about. Um, the, the question about international issues is, is incredibly important, but at some point we just decided we had to limit the scope somehow. And that just takes us into a whole new set of areas <coughs> which are connected, but are by no means the same. So it, it would have been really, really difficult. And also the top 1% issue would have become even more central if we'd started talking about policy for Africa, for instance, and, and we're not going to do that. Stephanie, Deborah, in particular, did you want to come back on this issue of the composition of, uh, you know, people, people working on inequality being um, towards the top of the distribution? If not, I don't feel you have to. Um, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a good point about, and it's a point we always need to remind ourselves of is um, uh, the, the um, you know, when um, this, the survey data shows that where people are and the position they are, you know, influences how they think about inequality. We have to also apply that to ourselves um, and be uh, critical and, uh, and, I think the idea of engaging people in focus groups and getting um, access to other points of view is incredibly important. It is, um, it, it is sometimes a challenge, uh, and, but I, think, I take the point, I think it's really important. Indeed, and that, that, that in a sense is why we've um, run a large part of this session. Not only have we looked at the attitudes towards inequality of the population through the surveys that Stephanie and Bobby have been doing, because we know that that matters for policy making. We've also, uh, with Ipsos Mori, run uh, quite a large number of focus groups to understand more about that, and that's something that we'll also be um, uh, will also be publishing. So it's something we are very aware of that we uh, we need to understand, and policymakers, I think, need to understand what it is that drives everyone's views about inequality. I think one of the, just to, to round up, I think one of the most important aspects of what we've discussed this afternoon is just to understand the complexity, both of the ethical issues, but also the complexity of people's own views uh, about, um, about inequality um, and, and about fairness. Uh, and I think actually this will all make us uh, a little bit more humble when it comes to making our final recommendations because we recognize that we don't have a monopoly on wisdom but I think if there's one thing I've learned from all of this work together it is that there is um, there is no single answer to the question what's wrong with inequality and there's no single answer to the question what do people think there are all sorts of answers to those questions and many of them are extremely valid both from a sort of policy and an ethical point of view. And I think one of the things that's very clear is that the excess simplicity with which politicians and others will, um, yeah, to, to use Bobby's terms, talk from a structuralist point of view or talk from an individualist point of view as if one or the other is unimportant, um, is one of the more damaging parts of our public debate. And I think one of the things we're trying to achieve with this is to, um, is to move beyond that and to help both the policymakers and uh, society more broadly understand and accept those uh, complexities and contradictions. Uh, but I should shut up because we're already um, three minutes over the um, allotted time. Uh, so it just remains for me to say thank you so much to all of the, the panelists here. Thank you again to the Nuffield Foundation and thank you to everyone who's listening and to, 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 to look out for uh, what I hope will be quite a series of these events on the different elements of the review that we're uh, that we're doing on inequalities, which will cover an extraordinary range of, of issues. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paul. This was great.